What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. We promise not to disappoint you. Hit that like button, and let's get them comments up. Got a real special guest on today. I know I always say I got a special guest, but I truly have a special guest on. A couple weeks ago, you guys heard the judge that you know did an interview, and he spoke about, Judge Sharp spoke about the young man that he had to sentence to life that was arrested at the age of 22. Well, today, we're bringing that young man on. He's the man that you probably might remember because Kim Kardashian was at the White House pushing to get him out of prison. But I'll let him tell his story because he can tell it better than I can. Chris, tell the people who you are and talk a little bit about you. First and foremost, thank you for having me here, Chad. I respect the work you do. I appreciate you for wanting me as a guest. And before I speak about me, I want to speak about those individuals that me and you are attempting to save our youth. You ain't got to be a teenager. You ain't got to be a child. If you even in the streets, period, it's two things that's going to happen. One, you either finna quit cold turkey right now, keep whatever you got, change your life, and you will be one of the few that can actually say they lived their life and made a way, got away without going to prison, without dying. Or you can go and say goodbye to your mama, your girlfriend, everybody, because you're going to prison. That's just the ultimate reality. Not wishing it on nobody. I'm just telling you the truth. Quit cold turkey and you made it out. Or understand that you're going to that box. With that being said, let me speak about me. My name is Chris Young. Anybody that know me in the streets or prison, you know me as soldier, soldier C, soldier the great. I've been getting called that since 1999, back when Master P, no limit was the shit. So yeah, unfortunately growing up, my mother was addicted to crack cocaine and I didn't have a father. Never even seen a picture of him. Never met him a day in my life. So automatically I gravitated towards my big brother and the other older guys in my neighborhood. My mother's addiction got so bad, it led to us living with no lights and water for almost two years until a neighborhood friend, a family friend, big mom, Miss Dot, end up adopting us, keeping us from going to state's custody because they had came and got us and was trying to put us in foster care. Me and my brother, we did what was around us because even though Big Mama now gave us a house and gave us food, she couldn't give us clothes, shoes. And unfortunately, she couldn't give us love either. She was an older woman. She already had a house full all together with us added in there. There's nine people living in this tiny house. So she didn't have time to tend to my needs, me missing my mother. I've chose the streets, me and my brother. By the age of 12 and 13, you know, we started out like anybody else, dibbling and dabbling with weed. And then eventually it turned to the dope. So by 16, for my 16th birthday, I counted my first $10,000, got my first tattoo, did all the things as I was young, listening to No Limit and Cash Money. I dreamed of doing throwback jersey after throwback jersey, tennis shoes after tennis shoes. And then the depression, the stress, the burden of living a life where you don't have no mother, no father, and no one to look after you. And then you got to take care of your little brother and your daughter. My brother ended up dying by suicide in 2007. Two years later, I was arrested on a federal drug conspiracy at the age of 22. I ended up getting two life sentences, but I'm blessed. It's a major blessing to be free sitting here talking to Chad and you guys right here today. I mean, we were both, I met you in, in federal prison. We, we, we did time together. And you know what? You had two life sentences. I had 40 years. And at the time, I thought, well, man, this kid's going to get out long before me. I ended up getting out before you. But eventually, man. you you know, you secured your freedom. But I want to talk a little bit about, you know, your childhood because you mentioned it, right? Like growing up in the streets. Because there's other young men out here that are going to watch this video. They might be 16. They might be 18. They might be 20. Some of them might be 28. But at the age of 22... You end up with a life sentence because you had turned to the street because you felt like that was all you had, right? Most definitely. You got to understand, it's an innate human nature to want to be loved, to want to be accepted, to want to be validated. 
whether you conscious of it or not, you want somebody to look at you and see your worth, see your value. So growing up, I'm already poor. I got holes in my shoes. I'm going to school. I'm musky. I'm stinking. So I'm fighting left and right. You already know growing up in the black neighborhood, out of Mac, you think the light skinned guy is weaker. You know what I'm saying? We unfortunately are racist amongst ourselves. The dark skinned dudes think the light skinned dude is weaker. And I'm showing them left and right. Now nah, you got me messed up. Not I. So that's how the name Soldier came about. Cause I was was trying to prove my worth, prove my value. I didn't have nobody else instilling it in me. So I took it and the streets was giving it to me. The wilder I acted the more they respected me and the more they loved me and cherished me. Chris, where'd you grow up? What state? What city? You're right. You're right. Thank you for pointing that out. I'm from Clarksville, Tennessee. It's on the Tennessee-Kentucky line, the state line. We the fourth biggest in Tennessee. So it's a small city, but it's still a city. It's got that hometown feeling where all the natives know each other and gossip about each other business, but it's big enough and it's a city where you can go to the other side of town with the military base and you can meet women you never seen before, bump into people you never known and blend in with the regular people. So it's a small city to give you that hometown vibe, but still big enough where you can get your issue. So you go to trial, they end up finding you guilty, and the judge has to sentence you to life. And he and Judge Sharp talked about that, where he didn't want to do it, that you came in there and you guys talked for a couple hours before he imposed the sentence because he really didn't want to impose life, but he had no other choice. Tell the people why the judge had no choice but to impose life at 22 years old. So the federal system has mandatory minimums. Depending on the weight of the drugs that you was charged about, depending on your priors, depending on all kind of variables and factors. Me specifically, I had two prior drug convictions. I had never been to prison before. And if you're selling drugs in the streets, hopefully you got some money to make bond if you're arrested. So me, I had a little bit of money every time. I always was aiming to get wealthy. A lot of people not gonna get wealthy in the streets, but me, I was blessed, like I said, since I was 15, 16, I always had a significant chunk. So every time I get arrested, I make bond, and I end up just getting probation. You know, I had never been to prison before. One of the times I got arrested actually was none but some crumbs, literally crumbs in my carpet. I happened to be in my work car instead of my club car, and they pulled me over and literally found some crumbs in my carpet. It was still enough that by the time I caught my federal case, the prosecutor has this little tool that a lot of people call this the prosecutor's dirty secret little tool. It's called an 851 enhancement where he can file and prove that you have prior convictions and it automatically raises your mandatory minimum. And once he filed that enhancement, it automatically raised my mandatory minimum to two life sentences. But the prosecutor, he had the discretion. He didn't have to do that. And he knew you were only 22 years old and he was going to send you to prison for the rest of your life. Yes, yes, that was his choice. And the fact is, that was a choice that he did because just like any person in the streets or any person in any line of work or field of work, they want a reputation. And his reputation was, if I'm your prosecutor, you're going to get the worst sentence you can possibly get or snitch. Me, I have a set of principles. I have morals. I have values that was instilled in me at a young age. And I didn't believe in getting somebody else in trouble, getting somebody else sent to prison just because I was in trouble and I was going to prison. So I wasn't gonna snitch. And he upheld his reputation as, okay, I'm the prosecutor that's gonna make you get the worst sentence possible or you're gonna snitch. And he used me as another example to uphold his reputation. I want some of these young guys that are watching the show to know what it feels like, man, when they impose a sentence of life. You're in front of the judge and he finally has to do what he doesn't want to do and he says, I'm hereby sentencing you to the life in prison in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. What did that feel like at that moment? So before we get to that moment, let me rewind it back some. In the feds, you can't make bond like in the state. Oh, my bond 50,000, that mean give them 10%. Just give him five racks. A bondsman might even take 3500 He don't even want the whole five racks. Cool, that's nothing. I got 34 dollars sitting up at the house. I got 
20 at my girlfriend's house. I'm, I'm up, I'm about 60, 70,000 worth now. And the feds, totally different. It's a lot of people that's never going to get a bond you get arrested by the feds. Most of the people that get a bond by the feds either are super wealthy and have connections, political connections, or they're snitching, or they have a simple case where they really don't even care about you. Me being arrested on this large drug conspiracy, 40 people got arrested, 33 of us was charged. I had been sitting in the county jail for three years just to go to trial. Went to trial, lost, and it took another year to go get sentence. So this is four years. So after I lost trial, I already know I'm gonna get a life sentence. And this life sentence is mandatory as we just told you before. But the whole time I was in the county jail, I've been reading, I've been studying, because as I said, I've been in the street since I was a child. I was tired of it. I was tired of the trauma. You know, being broken, poor, and having to fight because you're getting jokes cracked on you or feeling insecure about speaking to women because your hygiene is not together. That's trauma. That affects you mentally and psychologically. And then you start selling drugs. You finally got some money. But then you also affiliated, so you gang banging. And then you worried about jail and prison. All of those are traumatic events and experiences. So by the time I got arrested at 22, I was exhausted. I was tired of the streets. I didn't want nothing else to do with them, but unfortunately, it was too late. It had already caught up with me. So now I'm arrested. I'm sitting in the county jail, but in my mind and heart, I know when I get free, if I ever get free, I'm not going back to the streets. So I'm taking my time. I'm reading every book I can get my hands on, everything from history to philosophy to economics to quantum physics, any and every branch of study and discipline that you could read. If you was at an Ivy League university, I read a book on it. I was curious on how could I make a way without having to go back to the streets whenever I was released. So by the time I done got found guilty and I'm finna get sentenced, it's been four years of me reading some of the greatest authors and some of the greatest material ever offered. So by the time I step in front of Judge Sharp, I want to prove that if I wasn't given a life sentence, I could be beneficial to humanity. I could be beneficial to my community. I can show other dudes that, look, I come from nothing, just like you, literally nothing to go, living with no lights and water, almost getting put into state's custody, uh, fighting. Everything you can deal, deal with in the streets, I had dealt with it. But I wanted them to know that don't define me as a human. That don't define me as my potential and possibilities. I got the same brain, the same aptitude, comprehension skills, and intellect as somebody at Harvard, Yale, Columbia. So I went in there trying to prove that. I had all this information that I had retained and acquired over the years of reading and had it memorized. And I talked. I talked for like 45 minutes to an hour. And Judge Sharp started to engage in the conversation with me. Instead of him looking at me as a number, he started to realize, damn, this is a human being. I didn't know it at the time. I found out after I was free, but he said he did it because not only was he impressed, because he, but he didn't want to give me the life sentence that he had to give by law. So by the time he actually say the words, Reality sank in. My mama screaming in the background. The marshals, they done rushed over, getting ready to grab her and arrest her for screaming in the courtroom. My homeboy had to stand up and tell them, no, I got to let me calm her down. And me, I'm just sitting there in these handcuffs and shackles, accepting my fate. It was what it was. It was nothing I could do. Did you feel like, did your heart feel like it dropped? Was it like, damn, man, I ain't never getting out of here? It felt like the world stopped, like literally like it stopped spinning. As I heard my mama scream, it went from her screaming to like complete silence. Like I couldn't breathe, my heart wasn't beating. It felt like I was in outer space. It felt unreal. It felt fake. Like, damn, y'all really telling me I got to go in here and just stay here till I die? Because in the federal system, there's no parole. If you get a life sentence in the feds, that means stay in this cell till you die. That means legally and technically, you cannot leave the custody of the BOP 
until you're pronounced deceased. So yeah, it was unbelievable. You know, Chris, I ask you that because when I got sentenced, man, I was sentenced to 40 years. I was 24 years old and I remember it like it was yesterday. So I know what you went through, man. It was just like, I just got like, damn, man. And I remember leaving in that Marshall truck to take me to the jail that was 45 minutes away that I was being housed at. And I looked at my city and I said, this is it. And, and you know, I've talked about my wife on my YouTube channel a lot. And I've thought about her instantly when I drove through my, I had to drive through my neighborhood to get to where I was going. And I looked around like, this is it, man. And I was looking to see if maybe she was driving by, if maybe I might see her. And I said, this is it. I'll never see this city again, man. It's all over. Exactly. Man. And, and it was why you think at the beginning of it, I told them dudes, look, you might well go and say bye right now while you can see them. Because like you said, you end up in that situation and you just wishing and hoping to just see the city and your wife one last time. <laughs> Sad, man. And then, even when you talk about it, it bothers me mentally and emotionally, bro. I'm just keeping it real. Um, Sometimes I relive that shit through other people, man. Um, man, that's that that's, that's their built up trauma that... You are human, so you're supposed to have emotions, Chad. You know what I'm saying? That shit supposed to bother you. That's not normal to be going about your day-to-day -day routine and then all of a sudden get kidnapped, literally. Guns drawn on you, handcuffs put on you, thrown in a car, and then drove away. And literally, all of a sudden told, hey, you got to stay in this foreign building, in this foreign state with these foreign dudes for 40 years. You human, Chad. That shit supposed to bother you. <laughs> Does let me let let's talk about this. So you're a young man now. You're going to federal prison. What's your first mm -hmm. federal prison? McCrary USP. So a lot of people don't understand the feds is not like the state. The feds have levels, and depending on how much time you got, how old you are, how many times you've been in trouble, different variables that go into the equation, they classify you. So you got camps. You got lows, you got mediums, and you got highs, which most people call USPs. Then you got supermax, where people like the Unabomber, Larry Hoover, Jeff Ford, unfortunately, people like that at that. So I had to go to a high because I got a life sentence. And I'm going to USP McCreary, which is in Kentucky, up there in the mountains, in the middle of nowhere. They call it Misery Mountain. When you get to USP McCreary, man, I mean, obviously, I know, but it, it was a violent place, right? Dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you first get there, before you even get around the guys that's locked up, the administration themselves, when you're going through and getting strip searched left and right, that's another thing for guys that's watching this that ain't never been locked up or have been locked up, but you got your mind made up, you're going to keep doing what you're going to do. That right there by itself is humiliating, embarrassing, degrading to constantly have to get naked in front of another man and have him look up your ass come on man just just really just think about it how many times you want to do that and going through transit and transferring you got to do it sometimes three times in a day so when you get there when i first got to my career and i'm going through processing you know you didn't have police try to ask you what you're affiliated with and you brush it off, you lie, tell them anything. But to actually have the administration of the prison say, what car are you riding with? You can play dumb, be like, what car? And then sometimes you really don't know what they're talking about because we don't say no car where I come from. What the fuck is a car? But then they tell you, okay, you're not affiliated. You can play dumb again, say, no. Nah. What state you from? Are you from Tennessee? Okay, the Tennessee guys sit over here you sit right here at lunch, blah, 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 blah. So the administration is automatically planting this seed, planting this demarcate line that's dividing the guys. And even if you're not a part of a real gang or organization, you still automatically are a part of a prison gang. They're going to make you be a part of something. And then let alone you touch the compound, oh, yeah, you can't even get through the door of the unit. When you walk down the walkway, you got people at the fence yelling, everybody yelling, asking you what you is, what, you, what type of time you're on. Then when you actually get to your unit, uh, yeah, that was a whole nother thing. It's literally 20, 30 people right there. You can't even get in the unit. They want to know what type of time you're on. Let me ask you this. I mean, the neighborhood that you grew up in, 
and stuff like that. Was it gang affiliated? Did you go into prison with a alleged gang label? Uh, yeah, you know, and like you said, that's how it be, especially in the South. I can't speak for other cities. And I know a lot of cities in America are like this, but specifically in my city, you know, each neighborhood is something. This whole neighborhood GD, this whole neighborhood Vice Lord, this whole neighborhood Crip, this whole neighborhood Blood. So even if you're not officially down, officially a part of it, you know, you're guilty by association. You gonna have it in your heart and your mind because you've been hearing everybody around you speak this certain vernacular. They're talking a certain way. They believe in certain colors, certain handshakes. So, you know, and then when you get to prison, it's kind of a culture shock. Because a lot of the gangs that beef with each other on the streets, they're together in prison. A lot of the stuff that's so-called ops and enemies on the streets, you go in there, y'all gonna be together. Even if you think, nah, I ain't messing with them, it's not too many people. It's a little saying, they say, uh, you can't beat them up. You know, it's, it's 50, 60 people that's telling you these are the rules. And Bloods and Crips together, GDs, Vice Lords, Stones, they together. And it's actually harmony. Let me ask you this, right? You're from a GD neighborhood, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm from Main Street. In Clarksville, we call our neighborhood Main Street or the Fourway. I got the name Fourway popping because it was a four-way stop. And that's where I used to hang it all day long. You come across some railroad tracks, you knew you could see Soldier C. So, you know, eventually people quit calling it Main Street, start calling it the Fourway. But yeah, I'm from Main Street, the Fourway. And everybody, the neighborhood is considered a GD neighborhood. You get the USP McCrary. Do the GDs press you at first? Like, hey man, who you with? Oh, you know, like I said, it's 20, 30 people at the door. You can't even get through. It's Serene. Well, McCreary is a Northanio yard, so it's Northanios, it's DC dudes, it's, it's West Coast dudes, asking you blood and crib, it's everybody from Chicago or the other states asking you, is you GD, Vice Lord, whatever you is, but all of them together, it's called a coalition. So, you know, if you under anything with the five or the six, you automatically going to go with somebody to ask you if you one of them. So you're at McCrary. What car are you in? You know, I rotated with the guys, you know what I'm saying? But that's why I was able to move through all the prisons I did with the level of love and respect that I got. And I appreciate the love and respect everybody gave me from DC dudes to Bloods, the Crips, GDs, Vice Lords, Stones, Latin Kings, Northanios, Mexican Mafia. I appreciate that love and respect because I always moved like a man. I understood that I'm going to stand for my respect because I'm going to give you respect. So I'm demanding it back. I'm not going to do nothing disrespectful or foul because I believe in getting respect. And I know the easiest way to get respect is by giving it. I'm not going to let you treat me like less than a man. But I know I had my mind made up. My mind was to get free. I was focused on getting free. So me being so focused on getting free helped everybody around me stay out of trouble because they automatically would realize it's something better at hand, that we really are supposed to be growing and developing and aiming for a better life than the life that got us in prison. Why do we want to stay stuck in prison? Why would you want to make your time harder? Why would you want to sit around a bunch of men for the rest of your life. So my focus was on getting free. And I know that. I know that personally because I spent time with you. Let me let me ask you this, right? In McCrary, some dangerous things happen, right? There are some dudes that aren't trying to get free. There's some dudes in there that are doing things, and now they probably regret them. Like, damn, man, they changed the law, but I can't get out because I'm running around stabbing people. What are some of the things that you've seen, man, violent things that you've seen at McCrary? Oh, uh, yeah, you, you know it go down. Man. Any prison in the world, especially in America, certain prisons, them USPs I was telling y'all about, the highs, is guaranteed. And so my first time actually seeing somebody get murdered at prison, because I had seen street stuff, but in prison, it was a white guy. 
I don't know exactly which faction because you got different areas. You got Aaron Brotherhood, you got Aaron Resistance Nation. You got different areas, as you know, you can explain that better than me, but it was one of them. And they murdered one of their dudes, man. You know what I'm saying? He came in, he was a new guy. The bus had just got there. He brought him in the cell, fed him, sitting there kicking it with him. And next thing you know, they killed him. But the guard didn't even really know. Literally, it took for the guard to walk around twice and for everybody to just had that weird feeling, that tension inside for the guard to have to look through the door and see the body laying there. So I'm in the unit right beside it. I'm not in their unit. So when they got him on the stretcher and they pushing him out, you can just see the sheet soaked in blood. Plus they got his face covered up. If you alive, they're not going to cover your face up. And then his arm and up falling off the, the gurney, off the stretcher. Everybody knew he didn't make it right then. I think that the level of violence that you've seen in federal prison affected you mentally and emotionally? How could it not? <laughs> I'm a human being. Anybody witnessing uh, extreme, intense level of violence, and then the fact that the possibility of that is every day. So you're waking up to it every day with the possibility, the potential of somebody getting stabbed, somebody getting killed, somebody fighting. And you having that on your mind when you wake up, then you got it on your mind when you go to sleep. Sleep is the best time in there. You can tell shit. Sleep is the only time you truly escape unless you have a nightmare. But if you have a good dream, <clears throat> you damn it don't even want to wake up from it because you actually awake. And then you got to wake back up to this nightmare. I'm sure there are plenty, plenty of times when you couldn't sleep at night, right? Yeah, because you're thinking about the free world. You're thinking about What's going on around you? You're thinking about how the hell you're going to get out of this to get back to the free world, to not be around what's going on around you. And so, you know, that's a high level of stress and tension. And that's why a lot of dudes be what we call in there burnt out. That's just a little prison phrase for crazy. You know, when crazy, you know, and anybody to say that prison don't affect them, they're lying to themselves and lying to whoever they're talking to. It's just about how much it affects you. And hopefully it affects you positively because you're choosing to realize, hey, this is fucked up. When you actually are aware that it's messed up, you can make choices to realize you never want to experience this again. You never want to put yourself in a position to be put back in that place ever again. For sure. And I know you're fighting for your freedom and eventually Kim Kardashian ends up trying to help you, right? And she does help you to a certain extent, I believe. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that happened? So, you know, like I said, I'm going about my daily routine, just like anybody that's incarcerated. You got to go day for day, go day for day. <clears throat> and I have sickle cell anemia and it led to my hips deteriorating. So I needed surgery. Anybody that was with me at McCreary, they probably remember, like, damn, why little bro walk like that? He young and he walking all hunched over like his legs don't work. So my hips had deteriorated. My ball and joint had fused together, literally. They sent me to Lexington, Kentucky. It's a medical facility for surgery. So while I'm there, I find my direct appeal, lose. So you're like, damn, what's next? Obama and them had the clemency initiative. The Clemency Initiative blessed a lot of men, helped a lot of dudes get out from under them life sentences, them 40, 50 year sentences. I had filed and unfortunately I was denied. So now in my mind, I'm like, damn, what do I do next? But I'm still trying, I'm working in the law library. My job is actually in the law library. So I'm writing every Congress man or woman I could come across, every Senator I could come across, I'm writing every organization I can come across. I'm writing law centers. I'm literally mailing two to three letters every single day. And then one day I happen to come in and check my computer. It's an email from my cousin. Then it's an email from a, a lady who became like an auntie to me. I love her and appreciate her. She became like a surrogate auntie. Then it's a letter 
from one of the first journalists that ever put me in a nationwide article. She used to work for Vice News. And she sent me an email. And I noticed all their emails are saying the same thing. Oh, you in the Tennessean. Oh, man, the judge spoke out about you. But Taylor, the vice journalist, she actually sent the article. And when I was reading that article, Judge Sharp had resigned in protest of mandatory minimums. And he spoke about my case. And I couldn't believe my eyes, man, it took my breath away. So I'm hyped. I'm excited. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get out now. I'm going to get out now. I mean, I actually made a copy of the article and mailed it to a bunch of senators and congresswomen, congressmen. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get out. I'm going to get out. I didn't hear nothing back, but I did hear something from one amazing person. And that was Brittany K. Barnett. Brittany Barnett was a woman who was a corporate lawyer who happened to be reading about these different sentences a lot of people was getting. She had did a critical race theory class. And in it, she spoke about the crack and cocaine disparity ratio. Back then, you could have 500 grams of cocaine and it would get you sentenced the same way as five grams of crack. And she ended up seeing these cases and she started helping people get free. And she ended up quitting her corporate job and wanted to do this full time. And so when she had read the Judge Sharp article and I had a friend reach out to her, the actual journalist, Taylor, and she passed my contact information to Brittany and Brittany reached out and we had a conversation and she agreed to help me. And so, man, it was like a breath of fresh air when you've been somewhere that's, imagine being somewhere that's full of, poison chemicals and gas and you holding your breath and you just can't wait to get somewhere with clean air so you can breathe. It was like I had finally stepped into that place where I could breathe. But the truth was I was still in prison. And so Brittany had another client named Alice Johnson. So Miss Alice happened to get the attention of Kim and everybody knows the backstory. Kim went to the White House and got Trump to give Alice clemency. So by this time, Brittany and Kim have formed their own relationship, an own bond. And Kim wanted to speak out on some more cases. And Brittany offered her my case. After Kim took her time and read all the information about my case, everything that she could get a hold to, all the documents, she was like, yeah, I would love to speak out about them. And so Brittany, Kim, and Judge Sharp ended up going to the White House to speak with Trump and Jared in September of 2018. So by this time, I've been locked up eight and a half years. And so we believe and I'm finna get free. So I'm super excited. I'm super excited. The media is speaking about my case. I got literally guards, lieutenants, wardens. The warden of Lexington called me down there with the guards and the lieutenants. And they all just sitting there amazed that I'm connected to Kim some kind of way. All the guys that's locked up with me, you know, everybody excited. We've seen me on TMZ. We've seen me on Access. We've seen me on Inside Edition. So, you know, I'm excited. I'm thinking I'm going to get free. I wasn't going to get free. I was going to get transferred to Bloody Beaumont. <laughs> I remember, you know, I remember when I when I came there, right? And, you know, like you talked about, I used to tell people I'm doing something every day to get out of jail. I used to do the same thing. I, I I wrote at least one letter a day. I did something. I took a program. I did something to try to get out of jail. And dude's like, yo, you got to meet this dude, man, soldier. And I'm like, yeah, well, who's that? And they're like, man, trust me, man, this dude, you got to meet this dude. And then someone's like, yeah, man, it's Chris Young. And it clicked in my head. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to meet him today. And me and you, we didn't meet the first day. Like, I missed you at Chow or something. And then I meet you. And I'm like, damn, man, this is the dude. And I'm thinking in my head, I want to be your friend because if they let you out, maybe you'll think about me and help me get out. And I'm doing it. Like I said, I'm doing everything I can to get out. And then I remember you get transferred to bloody Beaumont. And I felt, I'm like, damn, you, I thought you would have been out of jail. I'm like, this dude's out of here any day. And it didn't happen. And you get transferred. And then I really felt bad for you. Like, damn, they're sending this dude back to Beaumont. What did it feel like, you know, not getting out right away from Trump and then getting transferred to Beaumont? Man, I, I'm glad I had been studying patience. I'm glad I had been studying mindfulness and, and manifestation because that 
kept me patient, like I said, but it kept me optimistic. It kept me knowing that I'm going to get free. I'm going to get what I believe in because I'm putting too much energy into the universe with my actions, by staying out of trouble, by keeping the guys focused, keeping myself focused, by having an amazing team that's working hard, Brittany and Enya and everybody she recruited to help me, Mr. Mark Holden, Mr. Doug Deason. Brittany is building this amazing team. So me being mindful of that and believing in manifestation, I'm holding on to my optimism. But it's a little voice over here that's crushed. It's devastated. As people always say, you got an angel on one shoulder, the devil on the other. The devil is whispering, oh, man, you ain't never going to get out. You finna go down here. Something going to happen, blah, 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 blah. But me being me and embracing my positivity, embracing what I wanted, because I made this saying while I had been locked up. I couch this aphorism is your mentality equals your reality. So I'm believing in that. I'm knowing how I let myself think is how I let myself react and how you react, but determine the next situation you win. So I'm like, I ain't gonna panic. I'm a stand up dude, ain't no flaw on my name. I ain't did nothing messed up. I understand that unless I disrespect somebody that shouldn't disrespect me, Unless the guys do something reckless, should nothing happen to me. But then I'm also knowing I can help guide and direct the guys to stay out of trouble. So I'm going to stay out of trouble. So I'm devastated. I'm crushed, but I'm not embracing it. I could have had a panic attack, but I brush it off. And so when I get there, I happen to get there with a guy I had already been locked up with some years and that I love like an uncle, D.C. Nick. So me and D.C. Nick, we got to Beaumont at the same time. So we're going through Oklahoma together which is a transit center. If you've never been to the feds, you gotta go through this to get transferred somewhere else. So we go to Oklahoma together, then we get to Beaumont together. So I'm already focused on getting free. And then I got a good person that I love and trust. And so I don't need no friends. I'm human just like anybody else. So social bonds are good. Anybody to tell you they don't need nobody, they're lying. You're a human being. You need some family or you need some friends. And so I'm like, all right, I got DC Nick if I just need to rap with somebody at a vent, you know, because I'm human. And when I get to Beaumont, they lock down. The first day I step in there, they lock down. And we stay locked down for about four days. So I can't take a shower. I've been on this plane. I've been on this bus. I've been in shackles. I've been in handcuffs. And I got to get black box because if you are the highest level, you got to get black box. So that's an extra box around the handcuffs that keep you connected to your waist like this. So I'm super sweaty. I'm nasty. And they lock down. And they stay locked down for three, four more days. So I got to wash up in the sink. And anybody that's been real nasty know that this sink is not going to get you clean like a shower. It's so automatically it's set in. It's like, man. This shit is serious. You know, you back in the worst part of prison you can be at. Lexington was still prison, but it was a medical facility. So, you know, they're a little bit more relaxed. So we locked down. We finally come off lockdown. I get to take a shower. I finally get to go to R&D and get my property. Then they get locked right back down the next day. I'm like, this is crazy. And then I wake up that morning. And I hear on the radio while I'm working out, doing my push-ups, Nipsey Hussle been killed. So I'm like, did she just say that right? A lot of people didn't know who Nip was at the time. But me having an affinity, a love and respect for those that come from where I came from, but overcame the obstacles, but not only overcame them monetarily, but overcame them mentally and want to try to help everyone that's experiencing that overcome them mentally and monetarily too. I had a lot of respect for Nip and I had been heard his music and I've been had a love for our culture. And what I mean by our culture, I mean street culture, because even though it has a lot of negative consequences, the intentions were negative. And so I always had studied different movements and different organizations. And Crips was one of them. So I knew Nip was a Crip and I always had respect for him. So hearing he got killed, I was like, damn, 
And so I'm working out, it's like we locked down, but I got to hold on to this faith. I got to hold on to this optimism, I'm going to be free. And now that I said that about Nip, it's crazy because today is the anniversary of his death. So you're back in Beaumont, things are real, but eventually you're going to get out of prison, right? How long did you have to stay in Beaumont before everything worked out for you? I did my last 23 months at Beaumont. So basically my last two years incarcerated was at Beaumont, USP, with people in the system and some on the streets called Bloody Beaumont. So yes. Was it still wild, Chris, when you went back? Most definitely, most definitely. And not to mention COVID ended up hitting. So somebody happened to get killed August of 2019. So we locked down. February of 2020 is when they said we was gonna go back to regular operations because we had been locked down all August, September, and then October, November, we was only coming out for an hour. Then somebody else got hurt real bad. They locked us back down December, January, we only coming out for an hour a day. February, they said it's going to let us back regular operations. And then COVID-19 happened to be spreading across the world. They locked the whole Bureau of Prisons down. So now we're not coming out at all. We was coming out at Beaumont. And this is against the rules. And I know a lot of people on the outside, they got a person incarcerated. No, this is true. A lot of people that not exposed to the system think this might be a lie. But we was only coming out for 15 minutes once a week. Imagine that 15 minutes outside of this nine by 10 cell, or what is it? I think it's like a eight by 10, whatever the cell size is. We only coming out of that for 15 minutes, one time in a week. It was really driving some dudes crazy and it was really, really a test. It was really seeing how strong you were mentally. And it was a sad, traumatic experience they made a lot of us endure because of COVID-19, which is crazy because that is a controlled environment, which means that we can't leave. Y'all are the only ones that can enter. So y'all are the only ones that can bring it. So if y'all was to just test yourselves before y'all came into work, it would never get entered into the prison population. Instead, some of us would get sick and then they would test the whole unit to find out everybody that got sick. So now y'all end up using 200 to 300 tests when you could have used half of that to just test your staff before they actually came into the prison population. They definitely failed, but let's talk about this, right? You get the call, you're going home, man. Tell the people how you got out of prison and what it felt like. Man. So my last four months, I was in the hole because Brittany, the amazing attorney and hardworking woman she is, she won. She won a rare argument, a 2255, which is a, a motion, a habeas motion that a lot of people lose. It's very rare to win. She won it for me. She won it in October of 2020. And so now I don't have a life sentence. I'm not classified as high no more. I don't have to be at a USP. But due to COVID-19, they're not transferring nobody. So they just stick me in the hole. Because I'm not high no more. Now I'm low and could be at a camp. I'm not supposed to be there. I'm supposed to be at a camp. But they won't transfer me because of COVID. They just stick me in the hole. So I've been in the hole four months. The worst part of prison you can be in is prison inside of prison. And then all of a sudden the lieutenant come up and he said, young, I'm looking at him like, what's up? He was like, you want some good news? I'm like, come on, Franks, I don't joke around like that. I ain't, cause he's a prankster, you know, he one of them type of guards, he's a lieutenant, but he one of them type of guards that, you know, joke around with the guys that's incarcerated. I'm like, come on, Franks, you know, I don't play like that. He was like, you want some good news? I'm like, what's up? He was like, what if I was to tell you you're going home? I was like, friends, don't play with me. He's like, I'm serious. What if I was to tell you you're ready to go home? So I jump up. I come to the door. I'm like, what's up? He stuck the key in the door to unlock it. I said, oh, yeah, this is too big of a joke. If he playing, he wouldn't put this key in his door. He ain't going to play like that. And he said, cuff up. I turned around and put them handcuffs on. And, man, it was unbelievable, man. It's 
unbelievable because I was getting free, but it was unbelievable. I was getting free from the worst aspect of prison you can experience. I was getting free from the hole. And literally every minute from the time I walked out of R&D, which is receiving and discharging, if you don't know what that means. So when I walked out of R&D and I was actually free and got in a car with Brittany, it seemed like literally every single minute I could feel the weight coming off of me. Like me and Chad both was telling you, when you see this amounts of violence and the amounts of anxiety of wanting to be free that you imposing on yourself. So that stress and depression, it makes you feel heavy. It makes you feel burdened and weighed down. Every single minute I was free, I felt lighter. It felt like somebody was unpacking a backpack that was on my back. And then I can't lie, like I had been free about 30 minutes. And Brittany looked at me, she said, I don't think you're really processing it. So I'm smiling. I'm like, how am I not processing it? She said, Chris, you just did over a decade. I don't think you're processing it. And right when she said that, I started crying. I hadn't cried. And literally, by nine years, that first year, getting real mad, might cry. But it's only a few tears. My own grandmama died. Big mama, the one I told you adopted her, she died in 2018. And literally only two drops fell out of my face. And and it was so much pain that had been built up that I finally could release. And I not only cried because I finally could cry without being judged or watched or being paranoid for the first time in a decade, but I also cried because I had to leave DC Nick. That's my guy. That man been locked up. Literally, no exaggeration, 33 years. At that time, he'd been locked up 32. And he was like an uncle to me. I cried for my homeboys that had just got arrested in 2017. They just got swooped up. And I'm knowing they're going to get some serious time. So I'm crying for all these reasons. I'm crying because I'm free. I'm crying because I got to leave Nick. I'm crying because my home was just now entering the system. I'm crying because big mama died and I never got a chance to cry. I'm crying because the man that I called my daddy, Mickey, he was my mama's ex-husband that I loved like a daddy. The only man that ever tried, even though he wasn't my biological daddy and he wasn't there my whole life, he was there. He the only one that attempted to be there. I'm crying for all these reasons. And it's feeling like I'm finally unpacking this heavy backpack. They got all this weight inside it and getting it off my back, man. <laughs> I feel you, man. Um, I've been there myself, bro. So I know what it feels like. You know what I mean? And sometimes there's dudes that are going to watch this show and, and they've been through it, man. Maybe they did 10, 15, 20 years. When you do that kind of time and you get out of jail, man, I truly believe it's not just about you anymore man it's about everyone else too it's not just about chris young it's not just about chad marks it's about everybody that helped us man and you know you mentioned Brittany barnett and she's just she's a phenomenal person i'm gonna tell you something i don't know if you know but when i got out of jail she helped me out financially man she looked down for me she said i got something for you and you know i've referred a couple of cases to her I, one guy that's got life out of texas i feel horrible for this dude i wrote his 3582 motion i sent it to her and she took over the case and i'm praying that he gets out of jail but that's the type of person. She's just a wonderful, one of the best people I've ever talked to ever in my life, man. And man, she stepped you. up to help save your life, man. Him and, I mean, her and Kim Kardashian and, and, and Judge Sharp. And I'm just happy that you're free, bro. For real. Man, I'm telling you, I appreciate it. And like you said, Brittany's literally an angel on earth. But like you also know that she recruited a whole team. And I appreciate every single person and every single part they play. Like I tell a person, we've all heard the old adage, it takes a village to raise a child. Unfortunately, it takes a nation to free a man and reintegrate him into society. And I'm appreciative of every single part every person played from Judge Sharp to Taylor, to Mark Holden, to Doug Deason, to Brittany, to Kim, to even Trump himself. You know, every single person, I appreciate every part that they played because it got me here free today, being able to talk to you and being able to hopefully warn and correct somebody from putting themselves in that same position. 
And Mark Holden too, man. I'm gonna say it publicly. I love that dude, man. He sent me a <laughs> autograph baseball, and he's just yo. That dude is a dude with a heart, man, of gold. You know what I mean? He's a phenomenal dude, man. I really, really, I love that dude, man, and I love all the things that he does trying to help people because he don't have to, bro. He's all the way up. He don't have to do any of that stuff, but he does it, man, because he cares. And he's a Republican, so people should recognize that. I believe he's a Republican. But And what you saying that, that's another thing that I happened to say at a dinner the other day. A lot of people don't understand. When you got a life sentence, 40 years, 50 years, 30 years, 20 years, you don't have the privilege and luxury and leisure to be partisan. You don't care if the administration Republican, Democrat, you don't care if they're libertarian or independent. You just want this system to let you go. Like I said, you got kidnapped literally out of nowhere and then took to a foreign building stacked on top of another man and other men in this confined space and kept there for decades and decades. You don't care about no Republican or no Democrat. You care about human beings now because you're a human being and you want somebody to look at you like a human being. And I wish more people could push the politics to the side and see that those are human beings being kept in cages. We speak about rights for animals and everything. And if we start to learn that animals shouldn't be mistreated a certain way, why are we still treating humans that way? People over politics. Chris, I'm going to get ready to close the show, right? But I couldn't think of a better dude to bring on and ask, you know, what message would you give to kids, man, that are on the wrong road? You're the dude that can really give the message. I think you're someone that they're going to listen to. So what would you tell kids that are on the wrong road, man? And maybe some of them kids are growing up without lights, without water, without any gas and electric in their house. Maybe their mother is drug addicted. Like, what would you tell them people, man? I appreciate you for thinking I can give them some great advice. And the main thing I would tell them, and it sounds cliche, but I'm going to connect the dots. Love yourself. Because when you love yourself, it'll make other people love you. And when you love yourself, you can find out what you like, what you're interested in, and realize you can monetize that. You can make a living off of liking space. You can make a living off of liking animals. You can make a living off of liking buildings. You can become an architect. You can become an astrophysicist. You can become an astrobiologist. You can become an anthropologist. You can become a lot of stuff. And I know it's cliche when people say you can be anything you want. That is a misnomer. You can become anything that you care about and that you realize that you want. Because a lot of young men out there don't even realize that they want to be this because they're not even aware of a lot of topics and subject matters. They don't realize that they can get paid doing a lot of things that are very interesting, creative, and innovative, because unfortunately we be stuck in a box, literally, physically and mentally. And so just try to love yourself so you can figure out what you like. Once you figure out what you like, figure out how to make some money off it, figure out how to monetize it. So you ain't got to get caught up in the streets and go to prison like me and Chad. Definitely a good message, man. I appreciate you. I'm, uh, I'm going to close the show and tell people, man, Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, share this video because this is a video that people should see. This is a video that some young man or some young lady should see and maybe it'll help change their path, man. Blow down the Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow, with respect, we're out.